Good morning. I'm Jim. I have missed you so much. It's good to be back. I will say a few things about, about the mission. It was probably one of the best we've ever enjoyed. Um, if you've been before, you will find this interesting. By 10.30 every day, maybe quarter till, there was no line in registration. They were all processed. First few days, I thought, what's wrong? But our doctors saw 7,427 patient visits. The numbers weren't down. When we step out of the way, they do a great job. There were actually 4,314 patients, all told, through registration. 250 decisions for Christ. And uh, one of the highlights for me was, I got a couple pictures of, of Jeremiah Ojera, path of the bishop's son, sitting in the dental line, sharing his faith with another kid who was there to work, get his teeth worked on. And, and that's kind of what happens there. They, they go about and they share one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, it was an amazing, amazing clinic. We left every day at 4.30. If you were there last year, you know that didn't happen. Um, we're not in charge anymore. And so um, one day, okay, we left at 5 because ER was packed. So, um, but it was, it, was, it was an answer to your prayers. And we thank you so much for praying for this week in Uganda. Um, God really was at work. So, Now, I wasn't supposed to have to do this next part, which is introduce the speaker. That's a joke. You can laugh. It, it was, it, I'll not say anything, but we have this morning with us Dr. Ed Stetzer, the dean of uh, Talbot Theological Seminary. But before he comes, before he comes, we should thank Bruce. Bruce! Bruce! The hero of last Sunday morning. So, Dr. Stetzer, you, you were here, supposed to be here for three weeks. You cut it down to two, and then you didn't show, and now you're here just one. We still only want one message. Just, just hug me. Just hug me. <laughs> oh. Bruce, you the man. Watch the whole message online from the comfort of my living room. Um. <laughs> totally my fault. Uh, deleted the wrong date. Anyway, you don't want to know all the details. 37 years. I've never had that happen. And now it happened this week. Those of you who are a guest, nothing happened. <laughs> it was fine. Now, for those of you who might be a guest or watching online, I was supposed to be here last week. And uh, just as the service was going on, it was my birthday weekend. So I'm just thinking, oh, I'm off for my birthday weekend. And then I realized I was not. And uh, so, but Bruce, really, you did a great job. And uh, well, you are the hero of the moment. And yeah, let's clap, let's applaud for him again. There's nothing more exciting than a spontaneous opportunity to share for 30 to 40 minutes in front of a group of people. <laughs> so you have a Bible, take it out. John chapter 20 is going to be our text. It is good to be here. And thank you for your graciousness. I got an email from your pastor. Uh, I don't even know, maybe 30 minutes after I was supposed to be here, saying, you from, hey, I'm in Africa. His question was basically, he was so sweet about it because he's such a nice guy. He said, just making sure you're okay, which is what I read as, are you that much of an idiot? Um, <laughs> but, but, but he didn't write that at all. He said, are you okay? You want to make sure I was okay? And I'm like, yes, mortified. Um, I actually tried to find some sackcloth and ashes so I could wear it today here. But hey, here's the thing. No matter what happens, the moment we're in does not pause the mission we're on. John chapter 20 is going to be our text. We're not living in normal times, right? It's a very turbulent and tumultuous time. Uh, and we can acknowledge the moment and still stay on the mission. And I think that's something that as followers of Jesus, we occasionally need reminders about. Because we're living in a unique time of turbulence and tumult around the world. It's a complicated time. It's a challenging time. It's often a divided time. But I think there's no better time to go back to the gospel, in this case, in one of the gospels, and see what the Lord has for us. So if you have your Bible open, or maybe you want to turn one on, you can follow along with us as we go. So the passage is John chapter 20, beginning at verse 19. It says this. I'm using the NIV, which is the Bible in your seats as well. On the evening of that first day of the week, 
when the disciples were together with doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So in this passage, we find the sending of Jesus to his disciples, and we are living in a convulsive, tumultuous, and turbulent time, yet we're still sent by Jesus into this moment, into this day, and the moment we're in does not pause the mission we're on. There are four things I want to take from this passage today. If you're a note taker, I'm really easy to take notes. It's the professor vibe, I guess, that I have, uh, but I'm really easy to take notes and to follow uh, along. And so the first thing is, number one, if you're a note taker, here it is, number one, is fear is the opposite of faith. Fear is the opposite of faith. When we look to this passage, John is writing this gospel. Now, John is a detail-giving gospel writer. When John writes things, he puts a lot more detail than Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tend to see things the same way, which is why we call them the synoptic. So think of same optic, same way. We call them the synoptic gospel. And then John just sees things with a much bigger, detailed view. So here's what John writes about this encounter with Jesus. Now we know, I mean, if you've read through the Gospel of John, you know that Jesus is about to appear. He's about to send them on mission. But John, because he's a detail-giving Gospel writer, wants us to know some things before we get to that. And he starts in John 20, verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. So um, the Bible here, John, on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is giving us, uh, again, a particular high level of detail. And so he starts by saying, on the evening of that first day of the week. So the first day of the week is, is, is Sunday. That's when church takes place. And usually the guest speaker shows up on that day. Um, so on the evening of that first day of the week. So it's Sunday, but it says it's that day. Well, what what that first day of the week? Well, if you have a Bible like mine that has headings in it, you'll actually see the heading at the beginning of John chapter, well, right before this heading, the heading right before John chapter 20, verse 19, is that Jesus sends the disciples. The heading before that is that Mary Magdalene tells the disciples, and the heading right at the beginning of John chapter 20, verse 1, on my Bible at least, is the resurrection. So it's that day. So it's Easter Sunday night. So on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, okay, so they were gathered together as one might expect. Now you have to remember though, they had heard from Mary Magdalene in John's account that Jesus was back from the dead. So they weren't unaware of the resurrection. I mean, maybe they didn't believe her, um, but they were aware, they were informed that Jesus was back from the dead as he prophesied. So as he spoke, as he said would happen. So on the evening of that day, John, the detail-giving gospel writer, wants you to know it's Sunday night. He just told you that Mary Magdalene told them, and then we get their reaction. Here's what it says. With the doors locked, okay, well, is there anything wrong with that? No, no, I, I, I think probably most of us Lock our doors. Maybe you don't hear. We drove, Don and I drove around a few minutes. I got here, I got here to make sure I was early today. I've been here since 6.30 in the morning. No, I, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. We got here a little early to make sure we would not be late. Um, and, and so maybe, I don't know, it's a nice area. Maybe you don't lock your doors here. I just, I just moved from Chicago, and we lock our doors in Chicago. Nothing, nothing wrong or sinful with locking your doors. So why does John say that? Well, here's what he says. With the doors locked for fear. So John wants us to know that it's Easter Sunday night, The disciples have been informed that Jesus is back from the dead. Therefore, he has had victory over sin, death, hell, and the grave. He's the true king of all the universe. And their reaction is to lock themselves away behind closed doors. So John is telling us something, right? And fear is the opposite of faith. It says, their doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Now, here's the thing. Um, Fear is still a driving reality in our society today. And I don't think we need to walk in fear. Now, 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 mind you, I think that there's all kinds of forces who are trying to cause us to live in fear because fear works, right? It's, it's an election year. Yay. 
So, um, you know, if you see the commercials on television, almost ev everyone says they hate negative advertising. Well, why do people keep using it? Because it works. Because people are afraid of that one, they'll vote for the other one. If they're afraid of where this will go, they'll go this direction. As a matter of fact, uh, you can watch cable news every night, and it's often driven by fear, or listen to talk radio every day, and it's driven by fear, or get down the rabbit hole of the algorithm on your social media, and it's often driven by fear. And far too many Christians, I think, are actually being discipled by their cable news choices. They're being spiritually shaped by their social media. And what I would say to us and for us is that instead we want to live in light of the fact that Jesus is back from the dead, the true king of the whole world, still is ruling and reigning. And we can be encouraged because I've read the end of the book, Jesus ultimately wins. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be concerned, speak up, speak out, use our voice, use our influence. We should do all of those things. But John starts with a posture of fear and moves us from a posture of fear to a posture of mission. And that's where I want to take us today through this text, right? Because the moment we're in does not pause the mission we are on. So we start with fear being the opposite of faith, and that's a good place for us to remember our call. Our call is to be primarily identified by another king and another kingdom. We are citizens of this other place, sent here on mission to make much of Jesus in the midst of a tumultuous and turbulent time. So let's go to number two on our outline. Now I noticed that they have a wonderful time clock up there, but they don't, it's, it's actually a countdown clock up there. You can, you, want, you can look at it, I don't mind, just take a look at the countdown clock over there. But it's at zero, 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 so I'm going to go until I feel like I'm done. <laughs> so I hope you pack the lunch. Um, so, no, 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 I, I got it, my time clock right here. Um, but but I, I want us to walk through this passage and understand what it teaches. Number two in our outline is peace is the Christian response. Peace is the Christian response. Remember, the moment we're in does not pause the mission we are on. So here we get to John chapter 20. We're now in verse 19, the second part. Now remember, the disciples were behind closed doors, locked in fear. They locked themselves away in fear, even though Jesus, the true king of the whole world, was back from the dead with victory over sin, death, hell, and the grave. And don't miss this, like almost everybody in that room ends up arrested eventually, many of them killed, but maybe right now they're not yet ready. So they're hiding away in fear. So Jesus appears, comes there, well, this is John 20, 19. Jesus came and stood among them and said. Now, now we don't know... I mean, John's a detail-giving gospel writer, and I wish I knew a little bit more. Like, if the doors are locked, how does Jesus show up? So he somehow appears, he's got a bodily resurrected body, but he now appears behind locked doors, right, because of the miracle. We're about to find out that he still has scars in his hands and his side. So it says, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Would you say those four words with me? Peace be with you. Let's do it. Peace be with you. Say it one more time. Peace be with you. Jesus said it twice, so I want you to say it twice. And it's not an uncommon greeting in those days, but John records it not once but twice. So I think it's a reminder for us of the kind of posture that a Christian would have. When the world's on fire, we're still walking in a peace that the Bible says passes all, or surpasses all understanding. It's almost hard to comprehend what it looks like when a Christian is walking in the peace of God through a difficult circumstance or a difficult time. And when I said that, surpasses all understanding, some of you probably even have it memorized. There's kind of a, I don't know, there's some verses that are sort of famous. You know, some verses end up on, I used to work at a place called Lifeway. You ever been to a Lifeway store? Yeah, lots of you. I mean, they're all gone now because you shopped at Amazon, but that's another story for another day. <laughs> but I used to be the vice president of Lifeway, and you could always tell the popular verses because we had them on cups or we had them on plaques, right? So, and this would make a cup or a plaque. And here's what it says. It says in Philippians 4, 7, that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. So don't miss that. So this is the kind of peace that doesn't make sense. It's hard to understand. It surpasses all understanding because um, the world has peace when things are going well. But we have a peace that surpasses all understanding. It says it will guard your hearts 
and your minds in Christ Jesus. So earlier this summer, I'm a, I work at Biola University. I'm the dean of the Talbot School of Theology, which is why I wear a blazer. You, he says to me, you could take off your blazer. I'm like, no, this is the dean blazer. <laughs> it's like official. It's like sewn in here or something. I don't even know. Um, so, um, so I'm the dean of the Talbot School of Theology, and we have a uh, seminary extension program in Ukraine, in Kiev. We have dozens of students who are doing their seminary work in Kiev. So I was recently there in, I was in Poland uh, speaking at a conference, and I, I decided I couldn't ask for permission to, from the president or the provost, and particularly the, the chief of security or the legal department. So I, um, I decided to take a side vacation for a few days in a country next to Poland. And as I drove across the border into, well, I didn't drive, but we, we, there were a series of complicated things where you got to sort of get in and get through, and, and you can't, there's no airplanes. But as, I, as we drove into, into Ukraine, I took a picture, and I sent it to the president, the provost, the chief of security, and the legal department saying, I'm taking a few days vacation in a neighboring country. And so we, we drove two days um, into the heart of Ukraine to meet my students. I wanted to encourage them. Some of them have been drafted and weren't there anymore. Some in our partner school actually lost their lives. Some had been now are refugees and more. So we went there and, um, for a matter of fact, the hotel I stayed at the first night, maybe you saw this week that there was a loss of life of two families in a place in the northeast of the country called Lviv, and um, uh, this is gonna be the northwest of the country. And we stayed a thousand feet from where those apartment buildings were bombed out. And, and so, so we went there and encouraged our pastors and church leaders and our partner at Kiev Theological Seminary and our students at the Talbot School of Theology. But I wanted to stay over to share um, God's word on a Sunday. I said, can I, I would like to go to a local Ukrainian church. And I, I showed up for that one, so that's a plus. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I went to the service and the power was out because the Russians were particularly trying to bomb the um, trying to bomb the electrical grid. And um, every night the air raid sirens went off. While we were there, it was the largest uh, air raid sirens, largest aerial bombardment in about six months. About 100 uh, drones and ballistic missiles were kind of sent in that night before church. So the power was out, but we went there. And it was, it was somber, but it was beautiful at the same time. And the reason it was both of those things is because they recognize they're in a time of war still. 800 people a day are dying at the front. You go downtown Kiev and Independence Square, you'll actually see the flags posted for the death of each person. And there's thousands and thousands and thousands of them. That very Sunday, we prayed as we sent off one young man who had been sent, now sent off to basic to join the war at the front. Another family were escaping as refugees because they had lost everything from their part of the country. And you could feel that, but simultaneously, we were singing of the goodness of God. Now, mind you, I couldn't understand, not all the songs had the same tune that we might recognize, but you know, sometimes you're in another country, and you're like, oh, I know that tune, you know the song from the tune, so I only knew two of maybe five or six of the songs that they sung, but the two I knew were about trusting God and His nearness in the midst of tragedy and difficulty and having a peace that passes all understanding, and I thought to myself, if those people over there can walk with a peace that passes all understanding, when their world is living literally on fire, so can and so should we. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus makes all the difference in the world. See, in Ephesians 2.14, it actually says that he himself is our peace. So peace is not the absence of problems, it's the presence of a person named Jesus. Now, um, the way the Bible was engaged in the past is different uh, 2,000 years ago than it is today. Uh, when, when, when I say to you, um, let's, let's open our Bibles, or I could say let's turn on our Bibles nowadays, right? So um, you sometimes can read along with me. But you know, 2,000 years ago, most people couldn't read along with me. Uh, so they would have the text read to them, and a big part of the service was actually the public reading of Scripture. Why am I telling you this? Because I want you to realize that when John writes, remember he's a detail-giving gospel writer, and he says, writes these words, peace be with you, not once but twice, it would make sense that they probably have heard five, six, or seven chapters of Scripture read before they get to this. So let me tell you what they would have heard read 
probably 15 minutes before, here's what they would have heard. Peace I leave with you. This is John chapter 14, verse 27, if you want to jot it down. Jesus says in six earlier chapters, he says, peace I leave with you. Then he says, when he shows up, peace be with you. So he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And then he appears and says, peace be with you. So sisters and brothers, in the midst of a turbulent and tumultuous time, I want to say to you the words of Jesus. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. We need to stand out. We need to stand up. We need to show and share the love of Jesus. We need to stand in the gap. And we need to do so because our hearts have been changed by the power of the gospel. So number one, we're just going through four things we're going to look at today. Number one, fear is the opposite of faith. John starts by pointing out their fear, points them in a different direction. Number two, peace is the Christian response. Number three is the cross. So number three is the cross is our hope and our motivation. The cross is our hope and our motivation. So Jesus has appeared. John's a detail-giving gospel writer. So here's what John records. After he said this, peace be with you, Jesus showed them his hands and his side. Now, you remember his hands had nails through them. His side had the spear thrust into it. Now, there's a lot going on here, right? Um, two sentences in verse 20. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. So two sentences in verse 20. First sentence is, shows them his hands and his side. Second sentence, they were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. You could say that both of those sentences aren't necessary, um, because, but John's a detail giver. So what detail is John wanting us to see? Well, the second sentence says the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Great. Why would they be overjoyed? Because their friend was dead, and now he's back to life. And that would be a cause for rejoicing. If you had a friend who died, who showed up at your house, I mean, that might not be your first reaction is joy, um, but it'd probably be a subsequent reaction. But in this case, is something more than, I mean, not that it's not a big deal that someone's back from the dead, but there's something more. The manner and the reason which he died is actually clearly implied in the sentence before. It says, after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So it's not just that Jesus is alive, it's that he has died on the cross for our sin and in our place. He can show the markings in his hands, the spear thrust into his side. So it's not just that he died and came back, it's that he has victory over sin, death, hell, and the grave. And if there's anything that should say to God's people, this changes everything, it's that truth. The center of our Christian faith is clearly built around Easter. Matter of fact, it's so strange to people when they first hear, um, and you don't really think about this if you've been a Christian for a long time, but I was recently sharing the gospel, I don't know, a few months ago, with a Muslim uh, a friend, and I, um, I tried to explain to him why we call it Good Friday. It's a strange thing to think about it as Good Friday. So, but when I explained that, well, this is because Jesus died on the cross for your sin and, and in your place, and it changes it changes everything. So John, the detail-giving gospel writer, wants us to know. Now, if that's true, that Jesus is back from the dead and he has victory over sin, death, hell, and the grave, as tumultuous and turbulent as our world is, right? As tumultuous and turbulent as Ukraine is, or an election season is, or what's going on in the Middle East, or what may soon go on in, in, in Asia, and, and more, we feel and see wars and rumors of wars and division and brokenness and turbulence and tumult but man if that's true that he has had victory over sin death hell and the grave then then god's in control god's got a plan and we can trust him i was um interviewing a pastor who's uh, recently been on went on to be with the lord uh and to be honest he was kind of a father figure to me in some ways i, I come from a non-christian home my my uh my family's mostly not believers and so this pastor in New York City, I grew, up in, I grew up in New York City. Anyone else from New York? Anybody? No? You got a problem with that? That I'm from New York? You from New York? Good, I saw New York, okay. Usually the New Yorkers, if they're here, they're like, yeah! And they're like, calm down. Um, 
So I grew up um, Irish Catholic family. My, my uncle was a New York City cop. My grandfather, a fire, fireman. I'll share more about that in a second. But So a pastor in New York City by the name of Tim Keller, uh, we became friends. And he um, written books, New York Times bestseller books. Um, I just, just last, was it last weekend we were flying back from Chicago and we had that woman we talked, we, uh, so, so Don and I do the, do the, when you're on a plane, you would do the, the A and C seat plan. Did you, do the, did you do the A and C seat plan when you're traveling together? It's the greatest thing ever. Now, some of you are going to, now I shouldn't tell all of you this because it'll be worse for those of us who knew this. So if you get on a plane, it's a 3-3. Three, three. If you pick seat A and C and then there's no one behind, between you, it's, it's like winning. So, um, but we had someone sit between us and, um, which was hard for us to be apart for those three hours from Chicago to <laughs> California. But we made it through. We made it through. Um, so, and, and I, I got to, uh, she's a molecular uh, biochemist, I believe, uh, PhD. And it was just the most fascinating conversation. She said, what do you do? I explained what I did. I said, I'm a dean at Biola. She says, at Loyola? I said, yeah, whatever. Uh, uh, <laughs> I kind of explained that I, you know, I train pastors and leaders and et cetera, et cetera. She says, so she, she starts saying, so why do people believe? believe? She did not, doesn't have any faith. It was the greatest. Like, it, was like, it was like a moment that the Lord just set up. So I actually said to her, listen, um, the Wi-Fi wasn't working on the plane, which is so irritating. It didn't even exist like three years ago, but now if it's broken, it's like the end of the world, right? So like, what do I do? There's no Wi-Fi on the plane. Well, because the point was I was trying to show her, I was, gonna, I was recommending some books, and eventually the Wi-Fi worked, and, I, and, and she actually just, I showed her on my screen and my thing, and she took her phone, and she ordered uh, Tim Keller's book, The Reason for God, right there in her Amazon account. Gave her my contact information, whatever, how to find me. Um, so, th- but here's the thing. So Tim was a real gift to the Lord to me and, and many probably other pastors and church leaders. So, but um, he was dying, and every, we all sort of knew he had this pancreatic cancer, which is, is tough. And so, but at the same time, the world's so divided, and, you know, he's living in New York City, and, and you know, there's all this cultural turbulence. And so I, I interviewed him for a, a podcast, and I, I, lots of people did. But so I interviewed him, and I said to him, Tim, like in the midst of all this, and I don't know that I said, I mean, we sort of all knew how, I mean, you just had to Google the survivability rate of what he had, and it doesn't, didn't look good unless the Lord just miraculously intervened. So, but I, you don't usually just ask that straight up. But I said, so Tim, in light of the division in the culture, the, your own situation and more, and what do you, how do you walk through all this? And he sort of leaned back and he said, well, Ed, and I, he said this to other people too, it's not just me, but it's so, it's so helpful to understand whatever situation you're walking through. Here's a man who's terminally ill in the midst of a very tumultuous time in our country, in the midst of the world in a place that we wouldn't have guessed it would have been 10 years ago. And he leaned back in his chair and he said, Ed, you know, really so simple, right? If the resurrection's true, then everything's going to be okay. And I don't know about you, but that's what I see here in this passage. He showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. He's back from the dead. He has been crucified. So thus the victory over sin, death, hell, and the grave. But now he's back from the dead. And if the resurrection's true, all the difficulty that you're walking through maybe personally right now, maybe you too are struggling with an illness that doesn't look good. Or maybe you're looking around in our culture and it looks like it's headed the wrong direction so many ways. And it is, and it does. And I get it. But if the resurrection's true, if we stay faithful, we stay connected to the Lord, we walk in his victory. Because if the resurrection's true, everything's going to be okay, ultimately. And before then, we live for the Lord. This is where Romans 14.8 so beautifully comes before us. Romans 14.8 says this, if we live, we live for the Lord. That's you, that's me right now. In our workplace, in our neighborhood, among our family members, with our friends, if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. This became very real to me in Ukraine. And next week, I'll be heading to Korea. Um, we're gathering from Christians from around the world, something called the Lausanne Global Congress. Lausanne is a city in Switzerland, but they took the name from the city. Billy Graham started this with someone by the name of John Stott. And this is the fourth time since the 1970s that the Lausanne Global Congress will meet. And I'll be there, and there'll be probably about 5,000 other people from 187 countries around the world. Some countries we can't mention because we're on a live stream. And we will gather together and hear from our global sisters and brothers, and we'll pray together and talk about how to continue the work of the Great Commission over the next decade. 
And we'll hear very real what it means. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we belong to the Lord. So if that's true, whatever you're walking through, whatever we're walking through culturally, whatever we're walking through individually, the cross is our hope and our motivation. We can trust Jesus because he is back from the dead. Number four, and finally, and I'll close with this. You know what it means when a guest speaker says, I'll close with this? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> so, particularly when it didn't even show up last week. But Jim, I didn't actually mark the start time of my sermon. So what time did I start? What time should I be done? So in conclusion, <laughs> is that how long, does he normally end at 1130 or is he just saying that? Oh, no. <laughs> this is what happens when you go to Dallas Seminary, right? If you, go, if you went to Talbot, we finish on time. Whoa, well done. Well done. Listen, you can pick on me all you want. I deserve everything you would say. <laughs> Not showing up last week. Oh, uh, I had a student. We, we, had a, we welcomed our new students at Talbot this week. We have our uh, largest income in class in a long time. Um, and the, <laughs> one of the students came, and we had the welcome dinner Tuesday night. And the student came up to me afterwards and says, I'm here for the welcome dinner, but I, I didn't realize that I had a class early. I missed my class earlier today. And I said to him, Brother, let me tell you a story. <laughs> you're not the professor who didn't show up. You're a student in the room. So and he laughed, and I said, just go get the, get, the, get the notes. In my case, I got Bruce's notes. And, uh, and by the way, Bruce, I don't know if you know this, I watched your entire message. And you, you're wonderful. I, I'm going to hug you afterwards as well. Yeah, there you go. There you go. There's an old joke among preachers that you should be able to, if you're a pastor, you should be able to preach pray or take up an offering on a moment's notice. So he, he did that right then as well. Number four, and finally, we go, we go because Jesus came to us. This is really where this is leading to. We go because Jesus came to us. Okay, so remember where we started, my phrase, the moment we're in does not pause the mission we're on. So we spent a lot of time on the moment. Let's talk about the mission. This is John chapter 20, verse 21. It says this, again, Jesus said, peace be with you. Remember I said he said it twice. This is the second time. So again, Jesus said, peace be with you. Then he says this, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Now your pastor went to Dallas, right? He makes a point that he went to, just made a point about that he went to Dallas because he couldn't get into Talbot. So if he couldn't get into Talbot, went to a fine school. Okay. I bet he quote, does he quote the Greek sometimes? Do you quote the Greek sometimes? No. Okay. Okay. Well, let me show you what we do at Talbot. Let me tell you what it says in the Greek. In the Greek, it's aute, in the same manner. So in the same manner that God sent Jesus, Jesus sends us. I don't want you to miss this. In the same manner that God sends Jesus into the world, not for the same purpose, but in the same manner that God sends Jesus into the world, Jesus sends you, 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 and you. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've been sent on mission by Jesus to your workplace, to your family, to your friends, and to your neighbor. That's what we do. We go. We go on mission. And if the world's a mess, we go on mission in difficult times. That's why the beauty of just hearing back the reports from your trip to Africa, right? We're going on mission. Yet it's not just mission trips. If the scripture is true, if Jesus did say, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you, your life is a mission trip. The decades you have here as a follower of Jesus are a mission trip to live for Jesus in the world. And if the world's in a tumultuous and turbulent time, how much more will your mission and your gospel stand out? I told you my grandfather was a uh, firefighter. Fire, he said fireman, you know, but he was a fireman back in the day. And my grandfather was, was kind of my hero. Um, he, he would tell me stories. He, he became the fire battalion chief, one of the fire battalion chiefs in the New York City Fire Department. He actually oversaw the house that took the most losses on 9-11. So my grandfather, he was not with us then. But he was a hero before you knew that the New York Fire Department were heroes on 9-11. That was my grandfather. And when he retired, um, he moved to Florida because it's the law there. So he moved to Florida from, from New York City. And so I would go over. We, we followed him down to Florida because my dad couldn't find work. And so kind of starting over. So we followed him to Florida. And I would mow my grandfather's lawn every Saturday morning. I loved it because, I don't you know, it paid me five bucks. But whatever. Well, I probably wasn't five bucks back then, but he paid me a little bit of money. But I came there to hear his stories. After the lawn was done, my grandmother would make breakfast, 
which is the only time in the week I had scrambled eggs and sausage, and we would sit down, and my grandfather would tell me stories of the fire department. He called me Eddie, and uh, you may not. Uh, he, he, he said, Eddie, let me tell you about this one. And there's this three-alarm fire, or this four-alarm fire, and, and if you're firefighters, let me just say thankful for, and all of our first responders, thankful for you. So, um, but he would tell me these stories, and, and his story often ended with something like this. He said, Eddie, when everyone else is running away from the fire, we're the ones running towards the fire. And it was true. And he, I just remember that story over and over and over again. And then I think that that's a good reminder for us in turbulent and tumultuous times. There's a lot of hurting people in the midst of the turbulence and the tumult of our day. Let me say, too, there's a lot of hurting people in places like California who've gotten caught up with the world's ways in ways that have crushed them or confused them or led them astray. All around us, there are crises. And as followers of Jesus sent on mission, like my grandfather said, we rush towards the crisis. It's a beautiful thing. In Isaiah chapter 6, it starts with this one phrase. It says, in the year King Uzziah died. You probably don't know much about King Uzziah uh, unless you happen to know that passage. Uh, Don and I lived in, uh, in England during my sabbatical uh, about a year and a half ago, right after the queen had died. And everyone was sad. It was really fascinating. The queen was just a very deeply committed Christian too, by the way, but very deeply loved by her people. Um, but centuries before when a king died, it wasn't a time of mourning, it was a time of fear. Because what if, that, if a king died, that means another king, and that king might kill everybody or, or make a treaty with an enemy, or, or bro- the enemy might break a treaty because the king died. And so, so times of the death of a monarch were a scary time. So when Isaiah says, in the year King Uzziah died, kind of would signal to writers in the past that this is a really tumultuous and turbulent time. And then he has this vision, and we don't have time to unpack it all, he has this vision. And then it says this in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And Isaiah speaks and says, Here am I, send me. Five words, here am I, send me. Would you say those out loud with me? Here am I, send me. One more time, here am I, send me. So my encouragement to you is really pretty simple. In the midst of a tumultuous and turbulent time, the moment we're in doesn't pause the mission we're on. So I want you to hear the words of Jesus. Have, remember where we started, because John's a detail-giving gospel writer, right? Fear. He points out the fears. No, points us instead to the opposite, that's faith. Walk in peace that passes all understanding, because peace is the Christian response. Third, the cross is our hope and our motivation, because Jesus did indeed die on the cross for our sin and in our place. And in light of all that, it leads to the high point of this passage, which is, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And I'm asking you to do what pastors talked about, what other, you know, what you had other staff have talked about. There's nothing new in this. I'm asking you again to recommit in fall of 2024, in the midst of tumult and turbulence and division, that when Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you, you might respond like Isaiah did. Isaiah said, here am I, send me. So your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers, your family, see you rightfully as one who's been changed by the power of Jesus, now living on mission because the moment we're in does not pause the mission we are on. Would you pray with me? Lord, we acknowledge and we come before you that indeed the moment we're in doesn't pause the mission we're on. Lord, in the midst of a tumultuous and turbulent time around the world and a divided time here in our country, I pray that you might remind us again and again of the words of Jesus. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Just with your head bowed and your eyes closed for just a moment, I wonder if you might think of your friends, your family, your coworkers, your neighbors. Just in your minds, I think of the places where Jesus has placed you. And then, if the words of Jesus are true, and they are, those are the places he has sent you. Where he has placed you, he has sent you. Would you take just a moment and say, Lord Jesus, help me to live as one sent on mission in those places and to those people. Lord Jesus, help me to hear the words of Jesus as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. 
And with that people, that place, your neighborhood, your, 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 wherever you live, wherever you work, wherever you serve, the family from which you come, could you pray with me just softly but out loud the words of Isaiah? He says, here am I, send me. I'm going to say the words of Jesus, and then I'm going to ask you to pray back the words of Isaiah. Here am I, send me. With your head bowed, your prayer, your heart in prayer before the Lord, Jesus says this. Just hear the words of Jesus, not mine, just, I'm just saying Jesus' words. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Now let's pray out loud the words of Isaiah. Here am I, send me. One more time. Here am I, send me. In Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen.